is Bob uh, Baker with Jonathan Kreisberg on Jazz Guitar Today. We're glad you're here. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. We appreciate it. We want to talk to you a little bit about your career, what you're doing now, your influences, all the stuff that everybody else has asked you for years. But I thought we would bring it up kind of up to date a little bit. Um, I've been watching you play and listening to you play. Uh, you're, you're very prolific on YouTube, lots of YouTubes. And a, a couple of things that I've noticed about your playing, a lot of people play jazz and they play rock and they put that together and they call it fusion or whatever you want to call it. And I know that Alan Holdsworth is a big influence on you, but you also bring classical into it. I mean, I watch your technique and I listen to some of your lines. I listen to the way you move the bass lines, I listen to your voicings, I listen to all that kind of stuff. I listen to the rhythms. Um, you're very rhythmically sophisticated. Um, you, you talk about rhythm in, in ways that like conical, you know, you remind me of John McLaughlin's discussion on conical. When I'm watching you play like a standard and I'm, and I'm listening to the choices that you make and I'm knowing that a lot, a lot of guys, that's the only choice they have. That's what they're going to play. What you're hearing is that's it. That's what they got. But with you, I know that you have tons and tons of tons and tons of stuff and i think the biggest problem that that you that i would have if i had your facility was just restraint <laughs> because of all the the rhythmic choice you have the the melodic choice you have the polyphonic i mean you have a tremendous uh a tremendous quiver of guitar stuff to draw from so let's talk about that a little bit um how i know that you studied classical but give me where did you come from? How'd you make it happen? Tell me, tell me a little bit about your, your guitar sure. maturation. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd say is thank you because that was a, a great setup. Um, and- Well, uh, is any of it bullshit? No, I mean, no, I mean, you know, I, it's, it's always hard to take compliments I know. in general, but uh, you know, I thought it was interesting because you, you touched upon some stuff that I think about a lot, you know. Right. Um, I actually think that in music in general, uh, irregardless of the style, there's always going to be different uh, philosophies about playing. You know, there's, there's, and, and some are, are very conscious for the player and some are just subconscious or unconscious decision making. Um, and I think it's a really big subject. The idea of when we play, how comfortable are we with what we play? Like, how well do we know what we're going to play before we play it, you know? Like you said, how many choices do we have, you know? And I think there in jazz as, you know, it's more obvious in, in music that's kind of composed music, you know, classical music. It's obviously very, you know, it's all about interpretation. It's not about right. what you're playing. And even that, when you listen to Glenn Gould's original performance of the Goldberg Variations, and then you hear the one he did as, a, as an older man, they're totally different. And it's really brilliant to hear how, how that can happen. Uh, that's both the same guy, you know. Uh, and then there's music like flamenco music, which I've always loved and was really surprised when I learned that like Paco de Lucia, the stuff he's playing is basically composed, you know, and that was like mind blowing to me. Like it sounds so improvised in a way, you know, I mean, I hear that there's passages that like, OK, that sounds like part of the tune, you know, what I've been told is that most of that is almost 100 percent composed and then performed in a way where it feels um, sometimes it's like sections that he'll, he can kind of mix and match, I guess. But that was really interesting to me. So, I mean, the, the thing that, that it brings us to, obviously, is jazz, which is improvised music. But I think even within that realm, which, where I consider home, you know, for me, everything I play is at this point in my life is kind of through the, the prism of jazz. You know, that's, that's kind of how I would, if I had to describe myself, it's like my way of thinking really comes from bebop, you know. Um, even though that's, you know, I wasn't a, uh, a kid born in the forties or, you know, or, or, or as a young man learning in the forties, there's something about that that rang true for me. It right. kind of combined when I was younger, I was studying some Bach and, and Baroque, you know, playing and, and I started to get into that analyzing that way. And then when I learned about jazz, I kind of, it, that came together in a way where it made sense to me. It's funny. I always think of that as almost like one lineage and then this kind of rock thing that I grew up on too and is almost more connected to like modal playing or Indian music or something because it's a different way of thinking of harmony you know 
but I, I always feel like my main thing is coming from this bebop way of thinking and then letting all this other stuff that I like or have played into it, you know, and then going through that prisms. I think yeah. it's evident in your playing. I mean, I, what, what I, I hear, I hear a lot of things going on. I hear a lot of um, rhythmic choices in your phrasing that I, that's not normal. It's not, it's not something that other people do. I think that if you've got a signature that I'm picking up on, I mean, I'm, everybody's probably got their thing. It's, it's the rhythmic choices that you're making in your phrasing that's, that's, that's a little just, it's just unique to you as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's one, one of my, you know, tricks, you know, as yeah, I, well, it, it's, I take, I take something that's familiar and, and I'll yeah. use rhythm or I'll use harmony um, or different melodic twists and turns. Right. To it kind jumps of, out at you. Yeah. Make it sound just like timeless, but also I'm trying to make it sound also, uh, fresh. you know, a little fresh. Yeah. 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 Huh. And yeah. I think that's a, a good way to describe your playing. Um, or one of the descriptors is that while you're playing steeped in the tradition, you're bringing a, a fresh coat of paint to it. And, I, and that's probably a horrible metaphor and analogy. No, but, I, I, well, first of all, again, thank you. Yeah, because that, you, that's you, kind you, of in a way what, I'm, what I originally was unconsciously trying to do. And then over time it got more conscious about yeah. that, that it was the, you know, I, I think of music a lot of times like a timeline, you know, and, we're here, right? And I'm trying to go back. And the further I go forward, I'm trying to go farther back too. So I'm going back, checking out stuff, you know, right. as far back as Gesualdo, you know, which is even before Bach, you know, you know, and, and go yeah, forward with ideas of what's happening now and ways that I can contribute somehow, you know, humbly, you know. In your shows and the music that you do, how much of it is, um, is what I would call um, composed in terms of your improvisation, how much of, of your performance is composed versus how much of it is improvised? In the strict sense of what composed means, none of it is composed, you know. Well, let, me, let, me, let me reword it, let me rephrase it. How much of it is um, where you're, you're literally jumping off the deep end <laughs> and yeah. how much of it is you're getting yeah, I mean, on the, ground? People, people that play with me a lot would probably say that there's certain tunes where maybe I have like kind of a game plan of like some story right. I'm trying to tell with that tune that they know I might build it to a certain thing that happens when I'm finishing up the solo or something right. like that or I may start with a certain kind of uh, at a certain place in this you know in, in the tune where I, I just want it to kind of break down or something right. even those things could change you know depending on the gig but I might have some tendencies a lot of those tunes I'll just have I'll have certain concepts that I've like I said before I've worked out to a point where I'm I can improvise with those concepts and I may use that concept in that not like a, a specific you know line that I'm necessarily no, planning to use you know what I mean let's talk about your tone a little bit what a sure. great tone I mean, I'm oh, blown thanks. away with that. It's uh, you're using an ES-175 and a deluxe reverb and a and a what? Oh uh, well, a you know, I use tone? when I'm on the road. A lot of times, it's it can become a little tough. But I've kind of at this point, I have a favorite setup. You know, which is usually if I if I have my way, I'm gonna have a deluxe reverb reissue, 65 reissue, which I think is one of the best new amps, you know, um, you know, and that's got a very organic tubey kind of sound, you know? but I also like a kind of sterile polytone sound too. When I'm practicing a lot of times, I'll use a polytone, but on the road, it'll usually be a, a stereo setup of those two amps. And for me, if I had to describe the main thing that I get from each of them, the polytone is just more controlled, you know, it's very flat and it's like a very even sound. And for a tube amp, they're really clear, you know, I mean, for a solid state amp. And whereas the Fender, you know, is obviously more spiky, you know, it's going to have yep. more kind of orga organic, organic reactions. It also has a, a nicer feedback, you know, because sometimes I use feedback actually to my, my advantage. Um, a lot of the sustain that I get out of my guitar, people don't realize it's actually feedback. So that's better with the tube amp, you know. With the polytone, it's just going to be, you know, a big low end -y kind of explosion. You know? Everything we love about tubes is what you're, discuss what you're discussing. Yeah, and it's also what you can hate, you know, because... Yeah, no, well, you know, too. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just find uh, that the combination keeps me, gives me more control too, because I can sometimes bring one amp to up and the other one down and get, you know, change. And phasing is a huge thing. You've got to be able to flip the phase on one of them. You know, sure. I used to do that by hand in the back of the amp, which is extremely, 
dangerous, you know. But uh, only you. <laughs> yeah, you know. That being said, I I hear the thing that mono has a vibe too, you know, and that's oh, absolutely. really you know that's really a nice. Are you thing. actually running in stereo? I mean, are you running like a stereo reverb and? Running? Yeah, I use my old Elisis Nanoverb to switch. Oh wow! Yeah. All right. That's okay. a, that's the problem with most modern reverb pedals is they're making them mono which is right. idiotic in my opinion because yeah you don't get the big the big yeah i mean that's sound stage. you know if not you know i mean if you want to get a spring reverb sound that's fine but why do you want to get a spring reverb sound you know the reverb is not supposed to that's the, that's the funny thing to me i mean i get it because the vintage guys want to sound like that vintage sound but the whole idea of this reverb in the first place was to sound like ambience and they oh. they, they and they did it with a spring, which was kind of like, it's kind of caveman stuff. It's like- Who would have thought that up, you know? You yeah, go. it's like eating a salad with a rock fork or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, so to me, with a, with a, with a digital reverb- Wait, I gotta, wait, wait, wait we, gotta, we gotta get that quote now. It's uh, a spring reverb is like eating a salad with a rock. I, I gotta- No, with a rock that. fork, right? A rock yeah. fork. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> But, but, you know, I mean, I get it because it's a sound, you know, and when you yeah. hear Grant, Grant Green with that spring, it sounds pretty damn amazing. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of people have made some pretty good sounds with it. Yeah, no, I mean, if you want that a, big soundscape, if you want that big thing, you know, and you spread well, it out. Well, it's just my point is it's culturally, we're used to it. We associate that with the sound, but actually right. it's weird. It's not more natural. It's actually more natural. The digital thing is more natural because it's actually using samples to recreate what it would sound like if you were playing in a big hall, you know what I mean? So it's actually sounds more real. The sound, if you came from another planet and you heard jazz, you, you'd say, what's that weird yeah. reflective thing that's going on there, you know? It's like some of those plate effects, you know, like they, they love them, but they're, they're weird sounding. I mean, if, if you, I, they're I, not natural. I, I, think you're, I think you're dead on. I yeah, totally yeah. agree with you. And Absolutely. of course, I love those sounds too. Yeah, so we all do. You know, it's, but, but I guess, yeah, for me, I'm trying to create a little organic, natural thing. And to me, the, the stereo reverb thing really puts it in a place. So. Well, the bottom line in all this is solid state stereo tubes and all that is that you get an amazing tone. I mean, your tone. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, I, I, I don't great. always agree because, so, you know, I, I, I'm very picky and that's why. You know, I hadn't I, noticed that. I, I'll, say, <laughs> I'll say for me, it's, you know, there are times where it's to a fault, you know, where, where I'm thinking about it so much that it's taking my head out of the music. And that's, that's, that's where, when I have to say, you know, I've, I've learned to relax a little over the years. So, about so let's talk about your, uh, your, your guitar and we'll talk about your pedal board a little bit. So you're using a, a 175. Yeah, it's a, I thought it was older all these years because it, 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 my year had a, a strange uh, serial number that right. could easily be read wrong it added like a, a letter or a figure or something right this one year they did it and i found out oh it's actually that year is that so, wow. so i thought, always thought it was around my age anyways it's uh it's it's not far off it's 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 a 1976 and that's it on the wall and it's 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 uh it's been around it's i've been playing it for a long time man a long time i mean i basically I, you know when i was younger i i had a i had a few guitars including a, i was playing a strat at the time even when i was playing jazz and i must have been about 18 when i got that the gibson right and uh, you've had that guitar that long yeah and it became Jeez. my main guitar within a year or two after that and that's pretty much it <laughs> you know in all these years i've been getting you know lots of crazy sounds out of that guitar just because, it, you know, it just felt like home to me, um, even though it was odd maybe to get some of the sounds that I was getting on that it's guitar. It's funny. You know? I mean, I listened to you play with overdrive, too, and some of your stuff, you know, where you're almost playing, you know, you're playing a definite overdrive tone. And yeah, uh, I, and those sounds, you know, I, I, I could have gone to another guitar, but instead I just kind of committed to trying to get a better it sound. It works. Well, but it didn't always. I mean, I had to go through a lot of experimenting to oh well out, whatever uh, you're doing works. and the cool thing about a 175 is the way that that neck is, it sits it's right here you know right. and you're really right. responsive and you, you know and you can visualize everything and they've got oh yeah and the 175 it's so balanced you know uh, that's why when i play 335 i hate that you take your hands away and the guitar will just flip right off great i can't play a 335 for that that reason uh, yeah 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 you know, they just it doesn't work but the 175 is i've you know, I've got some friends that have got them, you know, old ones like yours and older. And every time I pick one of those babies up, it's like, it's like an old shoe, you know, it just yeah. feels great, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really cool. And, and the interesting thing is, is that 
it's not known as an instrument that's married up with a pedal board. No, I mean, that's what I mean is that's the thing that I kind of figure out over time is a way to get different sounds out of it, you know, um, well, just well, by give necessity. Up, <laughs> give up the goods, bro. What you doing? Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, just a, just a myriad of stuff. Do you mean as far as... Uh, well, your pedal board, what, do you, what, do you, what oh, are you using? Oh, what I run through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's always changing a little bit. Of course. Um, what is the, some of the biggest things that you've discovered about using a 175 with your rig that, you know, they gave you the pedals that, that you know, what were the challenges that you overcame? And, yeah. You know, that kind well, of... I'm still, I'm still working on it, by the way. I mean, it's definitely... Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things actually in COVID times, there's a lot of experimentation about to happen. There's some working with a few different companies on some pretty interesting things. I'll, I'll say that one of my secrets is learning how to use the, like I just said, like, like about the feedback, using the right. guitar as an organic kind of an instrument, using movement with the instrument as part of progressive capabilities of it. And that, right. a lot of that has to do with positioning between the amps in a certain way you know using it for certain uh kind of re spatial relationships with the amps and the uh the, uh, the venue you know what's interesting get... about what's interesting about that is scaling that up if you go to a bigger stage you know you have to keep in mind that you, you want to be within this many feet of your oh amp. i've i've learned a lot about that you know yeah i mean about also about using monitors, you know, jazz musicians aren't very good with using monitors. Right. You know, and, and I'm, I'm kind of, uh, as, as crazy as I am about everything else. Now that becomes almost like a third amp. Oh, I'm it is. Live, yeah, you know? it's, it's, um, it's, it's energy in the environment. And with, with Nelson, I use condenser mic on the guitar too. So there's a lot of stuff you can experiment. It's always an experiment, but, um, being meticulous is a big secret, you know, especially with the, sure. with the 175, it's just not a plug and play guitar. You got to find ways to make it work. That being said, you know, then I run through, I'll just give you a quick run through. I use a, a POG that I go into first usually, which I use for these kind of, a lot of the stuff I did on wave upon wave, the kind of octave effects and stuff like that. Then I go into, I'm just taking a look at what, it, so the next thing I usually go to after that is the volume because I always want volume after distortion, right? but before all the other stuff, you know, right. you don't have to be affecting your, your, your trails and things like that. You Got know? It. I've been using a freeze pedal since, since, since they were uh, introduced. In fact, I, I, I wrote boss when I was about 16 years old with a plan to make that pedal. Yeah. And a funny story was I heard from someone that they met someone who worked with them, who told, who told them that they tried to make that pedal. And I, and I still don't know if it's because of this letter I, where I d detailed like maybe ways they could try it using yeah, it would be crazy if it was because of my letter, though. Um, so, so then you got reverbs and delays, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but the freeze pedal is a, is a big thing. I mean, you know, the only thing I haven't figured out is the freeze pedal does affect your tone. Yes. And I, I'm actually working on something now, a way that maybe will avoid that. From the there. question is, what are you doing now? What's going on? What's new with you? How's life? Um, what's your newest projects? You know, what's got you all excited? What gets you up in the morning and says, man, I can't wait to get to that. Sure, sure. Yeah. What's well, with you? Yeah. Well, you know, as, as you know, we're in a, uh, a crazy uh, kind of uh, once in a lifetime, hopefully, zone. We're dealing with this reality that now we've been, you know, we're talking four or five months of this. It's, it's crazy. No one expected it would still be going like this. But, you know, I've canceled multiple tours, of course. So that's been, I, I wouldn't say disastrous because for me, I'm about to get to the fact that it's actually been an interesting experience. I'm trying to keep a, a positive outlook on it. And you could also argue that once in a lifetime, we have a chance to be this reflective and have this moment, oh, absolutely. almost like a break in, in life. And for me, it's kind of an interesting time you know, to be in my forties and have that go through that. It's like kind of midlife, you know, moment, yeah. you know? So, you know, one thing that I've done that's, uh, well, first of all, I should start by saying it happened right after I released uh, my first live album. Yeah, so that's Capturing Spirits, JKQ it's Live. killer. Oh, thank you, man. Well, Tom, whoever engineered that thing. I mean, you know, I worked with a couple great engineers, but I was definitely a big part of the Man, the I'm, you guys, yeah. the tones. It's like, it's hard to believe that's a live record. It is so freaking good. That almost makes me want to cry because, you know, it was a lot of work. So oh, thank my, you. It's, it's, listen, it's, 
Yeah. For people that know, and there's a lot of people out there that know, I'm not the only one. That that record will be really appreciated when people listen to it, man. Because thank you, man. It's, it's hard to believe that's a live record. I mean, the tone and everything about the playing, the performance of it. That's a hell of a great record, man. You should be really proud. Thanks, man. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it was it was recorded pretty much just like you know, casually like, okay, well, let's have a way to document this because we didn't even know it was being recorded. I had forgotten that it was in the contract that the, the venue was going to record a board tape, you know? So it was one wow. of those things where we finished the gig and I said, oh man, I wish, wish we recorded this. And the, the guy who was running the board said, well, what do you mean we did record it? So it was like, oh, all right. Multi-track or just a board tape? It was multi, well, it's a multi-track board tape. You yeah, know all right. I mean? Like, okay. so it was a, you know, it was a couple mics on the guitar amps. I think it was. Yeah, no. We had two overheads on the drums. I think that's it. I don't think we had a, kick drums maybe we had a kick in two overheads maybe it was just that and then the bass we had one mic on the bass and a di but you we know had it two mics on the piano so you know the thing that i did was we really uh worked on isolating using frequencies and a lot of phasing sure. and stuff to really isolate and have some control over the mixing you know right. it was a real challenge because the bass amp was right next to the piano so there was a lot of you know especially when the tunes got louder so it was a lot of work, but I, I just thought the performance, you know, had something that none of my other albums had. And I realized now I may do all live albums. I mean, and it was, a, I love, I, I love live records. I, if I have a, if I'm, if I go listen to an artist, you know, and I have to listen to a lot of artists, uh, I want to hear their live stuff because that's what they really do. Yeah. And Lonnie's always, you know, I work with Dr. Lonnie Smith and he's, he's always told me that he's just like, Oh, you know, the real stuff is in the live recordings. Yeah. So, you know, I finally came around to it. You know, when you're as picky as I am, it's hard, you know, but I realized the secret is just record a live album, but make sure they don't tell you they're recording. That's the secret, <laughs> you know? And you can't, well, you don't have time to get in your head, you know? It's, it's you're, you're, you don't think about yeah. it. And the other thing is when you're in studio and you have a tremendous amount of experience with this, I know you got a lot of records, but in the studio, when those microphones, there's, there's, it's like sticking a guitar in your ear. Exactly. You I've know? been saying that for years. I mean, I, I've tried everything, you know, I do... The last few records I did, I had, I had the whole, I just didn't use microphones. I used studio monitors set up in front of me with the band and the guitar coming through that. But even that's not quite the same because your amps aren't behind no. you, you know? No, it's not. It's, there's a, it's, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. And, um, yeah, but I love to, I, you know, I'd rather have, I'd rather have a little less technical, not that you are suffering from that because you're not, the, the record sounds great. I'd rather have it technically a little bit inferior, but the playing be organic and vibrant. I, the I'm there thing. now. It took me years to get to it, but that's, I agree. I yeah. agree. And uh, so that's, you know, I'm very excited about that. People have been really happy with that record and, and excited about it. And that's, that's awesome. And it also kind of documents, you know, really a band, you know, right. The other thing I'm really excited well, about, which I really want to get into. Yeah. Is yeah. this, this new, uh, membership club which is something that i never could have done unless we kind of had this corona apocalypse you know what i mean it's really right. given me a moment to think about you know what education means and what it means to be um kind of generous with your life and your music you know i, I grew up in this time where we had guys like holdsworth and Matheny, and those guys were like you know, gods. And they, and it was like, you didn't really have access to their life or how they were working. It was right. kind of like a mad scientist, you know, and, and I grew up that way. And for me, the onset of social media and all this stuff and just seeing, you know, the jury for me is still out on a lot of that stuff as far as whether it's good in general. This whole concept of guys getting on Instagram, playing over play alongs or playing a 30 second right. line or whatever, you know, I'm not really, uh, I'm not convinced it's good. So what I wanted to do was find a way to, you know, basically it's one of those like, you know, if you can't beat them, join them situations in a way right. like, okay, well, if this is happening, clearly this is happening. Now we have streams. What's good about this? What's bad about this? Let me take the good and utilize it to my purposes. Yeah. I mean, streaming and the whole sharing everything on social media for free, all that stuff is it's kind of where it, where it is. It's, I don't think we're coming back from that. So, you know, I said, how can I find a way to, to kind of rethink this kind of artist behind the wall thing, right? find a way to do it where it's going to be mutually beneficial. Like I'm going to enjoy it. 
because I'm not really of someone who cares much about money. You know, it's like, for me, it's about the, the, the feeling I get from things. So right. it's great that I'm, you know, it's going to be uh, something that will add to making a living as a musician at this, these crazy times. But, you know, ultimately I, I, I'm actually enjoying this. I'm enjoying working with students. I'm teaching online. Part of the club is doing, is doing that as well as some separate. What is the club workshops. called? What is the club? So it's called Explorations of Note. And it's basically, uh, you know, the first thing I did was a book called Offerings of Note, which was transcriptions and, and right. uh, compositions that came out um, a few years ago. And Explorations of Note is basically, it's, it's a monthly membership uh, program, which has mini lessons. It has PDFs of all kinds of stuff I've played. It's got a, a tune analysis, which is, you know, going through compositions I've written and also ones I admire and different ways to play over certain tunes. It's also, it also has a bootleg section, which with a bunch of unreleased stuff and uh, older and, and even upcoming things, um, as well as, you know, the chance to study privately. So it's a, it's a pretty dynamic and kind of uh, open thing once you're in there. Um, and uh, yeah, never did anything like it, but so far it's been great. You know, we have a, a live meeting every, every month online and, and that, that, that first one was really, really fun. I thank you very much. Jonathan Kreisberg, yeah. thank you very much. Really thank you. It. Had a great time. Thank you, man. See you. Bye-bye.